Hello and welcome to the Swarm presentation. Uh, we're very excited to have you. This is the very first of many uh, Swarm events. And uh, a little bit about Swarm. Swarm is a community practice centered on championing open source AI technologies. We are a growing community and we welcome your participation. Um, my name is uh, Joaquin Melara and I'm the founder of Swarm. Um, this marks the beginning of a webinar series centered around neurosymbolic artificial intelligence. So we're going to be talking about three different major topic areas around neurosymbolic artificial intelligence, starting today with symbolic artificial intelligence. Um, with that, I pass the mic on to Dr. Manas Gaur so he can introduce himself. Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending the webinar. Uh, my name is Manas Gaur. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Electrical Engineering at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I'm also a lead at the Knowledge Infuse AI and Inference Lab and a member of Ambiguity Research Group. Both of them are extensively involved in the neurosymbolic AI related research at the intersection of various social uh, good problems, for instance, mental health, uh, crisis informatics, as well as conversational systems. I'm also a co chair for the ISWC this year. And in the past, I have held positions with the Samsung Research America and, as, and at the Alan Turing Institute. Thank you, Dr. Manas. And uh, now, Dr. Sanju Tiwari, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. So I am the CEO, CEO and founder of Shodguru Research Lab India. Professor, uh, I am also associated as a professor at BVI, BVICAM New Delhi India and a senior researcher at UAT Mexico. Uh, I uh, I have awarded a DART postdoc net AI fellow uh, fellowship in 2021, and under this fellowship, I am uh, associated as curator and member of some research group of Germany, like ORKG, INAFAI, DBPTA. So, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm also work, uh, pa in past I was the workshop chair in Knowledge Graph conference and also chairing several uh, conferences on Knowledge Graph semantic web and workshops. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sanju. Uh, with that, we're going to introduce symbolic artificial intelligence. If at any point you have a question, this is going to be an open dialogue. So if you have any comments, just feel free to bring them in. And as we finish presenting each slide, we will open up the room for small discussions. Um, yes. So. Dr. Sanju. So, yeah, so thank you. First of all, uh, we are uh, starting the first webinar of this series that is on symbolic artificial intelligence AI. So basically, uh, symbolic artificial intelligence is a subfield of artificial intelligence that is focused on the processing and manipulation of symbols or concept rather than numerical data. Uh, currently, the, uh, the today's artificial intelligence is based on artificial neural network and deep learning. But it was not always. In previous decade, it was experienced by symbolic artificial intelligence that is also known as classical AI, rule-based AI, and good old-fashioned AI that is also termed as GOFA. So uh, the goal of symbolic AI is to build uh, in an intelligent system to provide reasoning and thinking as human to, so that they can enable explainable and reliable decision making because they are embedding the human uh, knowledge and behavior rules explicitly. For example, if a patient has a fever also and also have cough uh, with breathing uh, problems, so uh, like we can conclude he can he may suffer with the pneumonia. Just like that, a system if have inputs like uh, symptoms like. Uh, 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 fever and cough and uh, breathing problems. So it can conclude that uh, a system can conclude that he, he has fever. So in this way, uh, we, uh, the symbolic artificial intelligence works. Next slide. So th this was the introduction that uh, I already covered it like uh, a, a, an, uh, an example of symbolic AI tool is like object oriented programming language that allows us to define classes, specify properties and organize them in the hierarchies 
and in this hierarchy class instances can also perform actions also known as functions methods procedures that uh, 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 for uh, and for to perform the actions and each method execute a series of rule based instruction to change the properties of objects so basically uh, uh, symbolic ai uses tools such as logic programming production rules semantic nets and frames and it developed applications such as expert system so could you come to the uh, next slide yeah so i would like to explain about the history that is uh, uh, the, the history of ai that is divided in two part ai winter 1 and ai winter 2 and in ai winter 1 it is explained about how ai is born like we all knows that the artificial intelligence uh, the term coined by the john mccarthy in 1956 and it is moving uh, in 1964 elisa was the first uh, chatbot that was developed at MIT and in 1975 19 during the 1975 1982 uh, developed the first expert system as a rebirth of AI and it is continuing at uh, moving for the uh, AI winter 2 in 1997 then uh, in 2011 the uh, it was the uh, it was the it was focused on a specific problem and continue uh, continue uh, progressing in the to, uh, with the new developments so with the uh, high uh, technology like machine learning techniques are introduced deep learning techniques are introduced in the, during this period so this was the uh, uh, history uh, put it on the next slide so now in this slide, I will uh, I would like to explain the evolution of AI that is started from narrow AI to broad AI to general AI. So narrow AI is also known that was the emerging AI and that is also known as weak AI that is designed to prefer a single task, single domain, superhuman accuracy and speed of certain tasks. For example, face recognition, speech detection, recommender system, and searching on the internet. That was the task that these tasks were uh, conducted in the uh, narrow AI. And in the broad AI, that was disruptive and pervasive. And it focused for the multitask, multi-domain, multi-model, distributed AI, and enable uh, AI. Basically, uh, like uh, it, like uh, automobiles, uh, self-driving automobiles as decision-making AI system comes under the broad AI and banking, some banks operations like creating the generating the balance sheet, etc. And then general AI that was a revolutionary, focused on the cross-domain learning and reasoning with broad autonomy. Uh, it aims to con construct robots that uh, that can reason and think like human. Chatbot are the best example of this AI. So please continue. So, so yeah. Uh, go ahead, Sanju. Okay. Any question? Manas, do you have? Do you want to speak something? Uh, no, no, I, I resonate your thought on the evolution of AI. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, so now I would like to explain about the waves of AI. Generally, we are uh, hearing the uh, waves. So these these are not new. Always the, uh, uh, we can see in the papers, in the LinkedIn blog, that first wave of AI, second wave of AI, and third wave of AI. So the first wave of AI is what uh, it was a crafted knowledge that uh, in, uh, include rule-based AI system. And in this AI, human defines rules for the intelligent machine and machines follows these rules. In the second wave of AI, they, they include all machine, it was a stat statistical learning and include all machine learning techniques to define rules by the method of classification, clustering for prediction and decision. In the third wave of AI, for con it was for contextual adoption. In this wave, instead of learning from data, intelligent machines uh, will understand the, uh, the aspects of the, the con context. That, was the, uh, that, that is the uh, motive of the third wave of AI that is currently we are running uh, in this wave. So please, thank you. next slide. And 
basically that this diagram that is uh, that is going to explain about the bottom up approach and top down approach that data to information and information to knowledge and how knowledge representation and reasoning performs here to uh, with the with the with the machine learning so in the first wave of ai there are there are four things that are mostly that are mostly explained here knowledge representation and reasoning reasoning type fair data principle and technologies so basically the knowledge representation Uh, and reasoning was the base uh, to give the ai a shared understanding of human uh, human knowledge and it also has the ability to fuse to combine different types of formats uh, in uh, into semantically interoperable and that can help to create the knowledge graphs for making the question answering and these knowledge graphs can 100 can uh, can answer the questions with 100% explainable results so these the reasoning type can be different uh, like uh, it, it can be deductive uh, logical uh, inference and uh, it can use the facts rules descriptions or properties to reach the decision and the fair data principle that is findable accessible interoperable and reasonable reusable so uh, the the basic the uh, the base is behind the fair data principle is knowledge representation and reasoning to make it uh, fair in uh, accessible interoperable and reusable because re uh, these features are make more easy and what which technologies are involved behind this so there are different dif uh, like knowledge bases knowledge graphs knowledge uh, orchestrators powered by knowledge representation and reasoning so these techniques works under this uh, uh, first of wave so this next slide just a quick uh, clarifying question so yeah. i see that there's a stack uh, there's a growing um, level of complexity of how you interpret information from data being at the base information being an overlap between data and information and then uh knowledge being a composite of information and in context and experience um so uh, what is the purpose of uh, having machine learning applied at the data and information level so basically this this structure is not new this is followed by the dikw system and machine learning techniques are basically for like uh, i have used the term like clustering and classifications so these techniques are used to learn the data uh, when we have uh, used data so basically machine learning playing in this uh, activity role and uh, on the other side i see knowledge representation and reasoning encapsulates data information knowledge why is it more suitable for processing more complex and richer uh, scenarios than so machine have... learning manas would you take this question can you come again as walkin yeah why is uh, knowledge representation and reasoning more suitable than machine learning at um, ingesting and working through higher levels of reasoning Okay, so uh, that's that's exactly uh, one of the questions that uh, I think most of the researchers are asking, and that was one of the most prominent questions in the AAA this year as well. Uh, uh, the the reason is that uh, machine learning is about the data, and let me let me uh, step by uh, uh, let let me just step back for a minute. So when we look at the data, right, we look at the data coming in the form of the uh, uh, features and the labels. right and when we look at this data we use it for machine learning we use it for various supervised classification task semi supervised classification task and lot more downstream tasks that are available but this data set is not exactly the data set that is available and in, in totality right a person goes over wikipedia goes over google search to give you the right annotations when we ask an amazon mechanical turk to do an annotations we don't say that that don't confine yourself to only the this data set and don't look at online or google search there are some cases where you put this restrictions but most of the data sets that are available they don't have any restrictions on the of this kind that means there's a lot more exploration that the annotators do for you to get the high quality data for you so that that sort of information is the knowledge that sort of information is an experience right and when we look at mental health when we look at crisis informatics the data over there is labeled by experts we always say that the data needs to be evaluated and verified by an expert so that means there is an experience coming into their data sets in the form of your labels when you let your ai decide on the data set why are you making that ai 
completely obsolete from the knowledge and experience that were used in creating the data set. So your AI should be actually functioning at the intersection of the both. A high level knowledge of experience as well as some kind of external information on Wikipedia, maybe on uh, health, uh, health forums or public forums, together with the expertise of the individual forms the context, right? Something that is helpful as a metadata for the data, right? And you want to bring them together. So that's a high level knowledge. And the, the, the levels of patterns that your model will learn is the, the low level information. You want them to be resonating with each other, right? So you do not want your model simply running on the data completely devoid of the knowledge. It should include the representation. That's why knowledge representation and its alignment with the data is really, really important. So if I understand correctly, there's a spectrum of applications that require higher and higher levels of reasoning. And data may be more acutely appropriate for narrowly defined pattern recognition. Uh, but when you go into areas that require exploratory experience, judgment, multivariable considerations, yeah. Um, yeah. that's when you reach uh, higher yeah. levels of reasoning and knowledge representation. Okay. Right, right, right. Uh, let me let me just give a quick example uh, to make this a little bit clear. If you look at if you look at Chat GPT or any or any higher version of GPT, and you ask this question, uh, a person with an LLM, right, is hallucinating in a multi-party conversation in a court. Let me just give you a question over here, right? This sentence has a person is with an LLM is hallucinating in a multi-party conversation in the court, right? A person with a knowledge, sufficient legal knowledge, will understand that this is a person of, with an LLM degree who is actually talking about some information in the court and he has some kind of, let's say, absurd conversation going on, right? But if you look at it as a chat GPT, it will consider LLM means a large language model who is hallucinating in the legal court and making a decision which is uh, uh, op uh, offensive, right? The person and the court are the context to put this straight, this entire line into 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 picture, right? But how do you make that focus for a model, right? Where, where it should focus? It? Does it focus on LLM means all of the world? LLM means large language models. There is nothing else that is LLM that can have representation, right? LLM can be a, a can be a degree in law, and LLM can be a large language model as well, right? So how do you make that distinction given the context? So that's where you need a top down as well as a bottom-up uh, design. Thank you for, for answering my question. Um, I'm fine to proceed to the next slide if you guys are as well. Yeah. Okay. So so here in the task, uh, now, now the, uh, I would like to explain about the task of AI. Generally, we have three major tasks, that uh, knowledge representation, knowledge reasoning, and knowledge learning. So it is explained here that input takes and uh, it is processed uh, as a, uh, a black box. And uh, like uh, these features are, uh, these uh, process are doing under this uh, uh, duration, like classification, regression, generation, and, uh, pro uh, and provide the outputs. So in the knowledge representation, it, it is the phase of modeling inputs, outputs, and, uh, and, and the uh, internal states that is the processing and uh, it uh, comes under the new that that can uh, be initial stage and then knowledge reasoning that is uh, provide the output from the processing by taking the inputs and processing then then give the derive the outputs uh, by internal states and it comes as a, a forward propagation and then the third step is to knowledge learning by engineering the uh, internal state that is uh, uh, that is called also the back backward propagation and these major tasks of ai that is uh, surround, uh, the, the whole process is surrounding this so could you uh, come to the next slide okay yeah i think uh, manas will explain about these uh, uh, tasks and para paradigms of ai so i will uh, hand over to him Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, Sanju. Uh, and let me just extend the notion of the two uh, tasks that uh, are, are essentially the task of AI with the two paradigms. Yes. So here I'm, what my focus is going to be is on two things. One is that how does an AI by itself work and how and where you want to uh, position your symbolic structures. 
So this is a very high level diagram. We'll go into that details eventually when we go on in the subsequent slides. But this is going to be a very high level, uh, I would say an aerial view of how these things separate each other. So on the left side is what I would consider is a, a, a manifestation of symbolic knowledge helping the neurosymbolic AI. Something very similar to the previous slide that Sanju just showed on, uh, showed. And what in this scenario, what we are trying to say is that the knowledge graph has some kind of representation. And we, when we say talk about representation, we talk about nodes and their relationships. So some kind of a graphical structure. You can visualize this as a graphical structure. Now, neural networks, on the other hand, are very good at representation learning. They are good representation learners. So what we really want them to do is that to not only learn the representation over the data, over the data but also look at the representation in the knowledge graph. Now, consider this thing very simple. Let's say I, I have given you a data set, a, a huge tons of the data set. I would say not tons. I would say, like, say, 100,000, right? And you, your model of neural network just learns the representation of the data, right, from various modalities. Now, you want that once your neural network has learned a representation, can you use that representation to gather some information or extract some information from a knowledge graph? That extraction process is looks like a sanity check whether your neural network actually learned the right representation in the data, and that is well corroborated with the knowledge graph. So the, the, this blue line, that, that the, the bidirectional error that you see on the photo, uh, is essentially a way of checking uh, or probing your neural networks with the knowledge graph. Now, wherever there is an information loss between the neural network and what is there in knowledge graph, that's where you want to fulfill. Now, once you have achieved this point, you go into the final prediction layer where you do the final prediction, which we consider as a symbolic reasoning, because that's where you're making the check whether your decision aligns with the uh, with the ground truth or not. Now, why do we have a symbolic reasoning block just above these two? The reason is that you do not want the model to just yield outcomes without measuring the constraints, without checking the rules, without checking any kind of a guidelines or specifications. So you want your model to be adhering to it. Now, if you don't do a symbolic block, then the other alternative is, is very similar to what it's working at the moment called the guardrails. You put a lot of if and else rules at the top of your decisions that will curtail your model from making any decision. So here you get the separation. Either put a guardrail, which is above the decisions and actions, or you put out the symbolic reasoning, which is at the block over here. Yeah. Can you move to the next slide, Hoken? Yeah. So, and because of the structures of the symbolic integration, as well as with the knowledge graph, we have various utilities nowadays, which are which we consider as a safe uh, uh, critical applications, but we, which actually a desire a neurosymbolic or I would say symbolic driven uh, neural network integrations. How uh, one is autonomous driving? There is a fantastic set of uh, use cases from Bosch Research, uh, headed by Corey Henson. Uh, as far as I remember, and they have a good, uh, a very illustrative ontologies on, auto on autonomous driving vehicles that, that is using knowledge graph embeddings as well as a neural networks to make decisions. Now, what is the use case? The use case is, for instance, you have a Tesla being trained in, in California. Can the Tesla be, be driven in New York, New York City? What are the changes in these two scenarios? Yes, the new the New York the, the New York City is essentially uh, basically uh, is essentially a, a a Manhattan colony, which is basically looking at like there's a uh, everything is in squares, and whereas the California is elongated along the east west coast, so there is some kind of structural geographical properties that goes aligned. So that's where you. Uh, talk about in autonomous systems. Another is the digital assistants, right? The digital assistant is pretty much important because they really have to cater to the individual. They have to cater to their understanding, their their preferences. How do you do personalization in, in the real time? The third is the medical diagnosis system where you want, you are looking at image to text, text to image converters uh, in terms of an AI, and you want them to be resonating with the ground truth, which is the expert knowledge of, of, of clinicians or radiologists, right? And extending to that is a computer vision usage. I would say the computer vision and autonomous drivers are pretty much are very intertwined to each other in terms of when, when, when we talk about symbolic AI in, in principle. Uh, can you move to the next slide? Okay, so here's what I want to just do a twist 
in what uh, Sanju showed a very exciting overview of the time of how things are evaluating. I resonate with Sanju's part that the McCarthy and Hayes were the really the pivotal or the pioneers in in in, uh, in artificial intelligence and and enumerated a very exciting number of philosophical problems in the 1968 paper. Uh, Douglas Hofstadter, in his book and Gordon Lesher back, uh, gave a very nice treatment of the same thing in 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 at, uh, at a more like more like a theoretical uh, flavor or theoretical side. Then uh, I would uh, also cannot uh, ignore my advisor Amit Sheth, who has actually done a very extensive amount of work in the context of world models, semantic enhancement engines, semantics of the semantic web, and computing for human experience. I really like the 2010 work which talks about how human involvement is important in decision making. You're computing, you're designing your system for the human, for the humanity, and every single issues is worth addressing in, in, uh, in computing for human experience. And then the 2006, uh, as, uh, by the, and I, I also credit uh, Leslie Valiant for his marvelous work in 2006 on knowledge infusion in the AAAI, which actually talks about this question and, and that also triggers a lot of my comprehension in my dissertation on how machines can acquire and manipulate common sense knowledge. That is where I just gave an example of LLM are related to a person and LLM by default. So by default, LLM is always always considered as large language models, but LLM can also be a degree in, in law, right? Then connecting with Daniel Kahneman, which is the thinking fast and slow. And that's also a pivotal paper into the, uh, a book that in 2011, which uh, gives a first introduction to the neurosymbolic AI uh, in principle. And there are other works uh, in the context of cognitive science by Arter on neurosymbolic AI for cognitive reasoning. I do not want to go into that loud route because that's a little bit deviating from computer science. And then we are looking at 2019 rebooting AI by Gary Marcus, a completely uh, in favor and pro propelling notion of, of how knowledge is really, really required in AI for various purposes. Uh, next slide, Wokun. So that uh, slide was very interesting. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, what I want to talk about over here is that what if I don't care about knowledge, right? What if I don't really need knowledge at all, right? What if I have a gigantic system like LLMs and completely drive them by by their own statistical way? What are the issues that I have? So this issue is I'm I'm pretty much sure there can be many more about it. Uh, some of them are taken from this fantastic paper by. Uh, uh, so, uh, 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 John Gutag and Suresh Harini from MIT, but I do add some kind of more uh, ingredients to the bias problem. So the first thing is a historical bias, right? You you turn you you learn over a historical data, and you expect your LLM to uh, to uh, to present insightful insight to the current data. That's not possible. So that's one of the issue of historical bias. If you really learn, if you really want the AI to learn from the history, how can it work? How can it work in the prediction of the future? Right. The second is a representation bias, where how much of this information needs to be taken from the knowledge or how much of the information needs to be taken from the data is still an, an open challenging task. Right. The third is a measurement bias. Right. We always go by precision record and F1 score. But are they really talking about the model's attention to details? I don't think so. So that's, again, a very important factor in terms of measurement bias. For example, the text toxicity. Or, or you talk about uh, uh, gender bias, you talk about uh, uh, our, our discussions in terms of the healthcare and many other applications. Then comes the aggregation bias. That's my favorite. Everyone does a concatenation operation in their deep learning or in their machine learning. Or they look, they look at various arithmetic operations and they blindly use it because that gives an accuracy improvement. But that's also add to an aggregation bias, right? You can't say that I can aggregate over the data in 2000, from 2010 to 2020 on healthcare and make a decision on 2021. That's not an aggregation, how the things work in healthcare business, right? You can't expect that over that uh, I can make a very nice COVID-19 predictor by using all the data in the past of COVID-19. That's not what, uh, what happens in, in real life in critical applications. Something similar is an evaluation bias which is basically you're, if you're heavily evaluating your data to the labels, it issues, it creates issues in your data sets. And benchmarks needs to be driven by the knowledge and should not be simply driven by the data. 
And if you are really interested, there are two forms of benchmarks nowadays. One is knowledge intensive benchmarks, another is knowledge uh, independent benchmarks, right? And the deployment bias is, is important because where are you putting your system to, right? Who will be the likely stakeholders? How are they? How will they be using your system? So all of these categories are important in understanding how you uh, in, uh, create knowledge, how do you use knowledge, and how you can build systems that works with the knowledge in, in practice. Next a slide, Hawken. So uh, let's just take one example of this entire bias situation, right? Now, I can actually train, I can train a model. Like, let's say I, the dot at the top, assume this, that it is a, a, a data set uh, that is considering of a, of a particular uh, data point from an individual. And we are talking about an individual. I, I For sake of anonymity, I did not include the ex example. But let's take an example of an individual who is showing an anxiety, right? And we want to examine that whether the person has an anxiety or not, how the frequency of the or the degree of the frequency, what are the causes and what the remedies are, right? But how do we treat these multifaceted problems? We, we position them as a classification task. Oh, let's look at the frequency, whether there's a frequency word in the text or not, or if there's a cause word in this or not, or whether there's a remedy words or not. But does an expert looks like that of, uh, of frequency of causes or remedies? No, they work in the sequence of a symbolic structure. The symbolic structure looks like, do you feel nervous? And a first sanity check for an anxiety is nervousness, right? How often do you feel nervous, right? What are the causes of your nervousness? So hear me out what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to put down a top down sequence of every questions that I'm asking to the same input. And what I want this is that I'm turning this entire data set into a bunch of trees. And we know that the trees represent a, is a very simple mechanistic, mechanistic view of interpretability or, or, of, or, or symbolic structures. And that's what I am showing over here. So rather than dealing with the or structuring a problem simply as a classification, what if you change the structure of the problem into a trees? And trees are very friendly with symbolic structures. And now, can I, I can have the, this duo of knowledge and this tree to talk to each other. So that's what my my decision. And you can go over over and over with these things. Let's let's say I ask this question with yes and no. This is my tree. What if I start this question with frequency and degree? Would my uh, opinion change? If my if I start my tree with causes, would my opinion will change? If I start with remedies, what will happen? We only look at one way. What if the counterfactual is even stronger than the right? So those are the really nice, exciting questions that we can yeah, we can discuss in more detail in symbolic AI. Can you next? Can you move to the next slide? Yes, and this is an example, another example of a similar structure in the context of suicidality, where we want to use symbolic knowledge in the form of these questionnaires, which you see on the right hand side is an image of a questionnaire. Right, and how do we turn this questionnaire into a symbolic structure and use that in 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 AI systems? Now, what I'm doing over here, I'm I'm the model is still very much fertile in making a prediction of yes and no, but now I'm not telling the model do it in sequence, follow this flow flow chart, and this flow chart is the same symbolic reasoning block that I showed you in few slides back of how this things looks like. The symbolic reasoning block is exactly the place where this this flowchart with fit. And it what it will tell you is that whether the model has answered the question number one, does the model has answered the question number two without giving the user the final outcome. I'm not talking about the final outcome. I'm talking about a penultimate layer before the prediction. I'm talking about question number one, question number two. And if their answer is no, I have a label over there. But if answer is yes, then I need to have an answer for three, four, and five before I make a prediction. If it is not available, then I cannot make a decision and I will refrain from making a decision. So that's what your model needs to achieve with the use of symbolic knowledge. Popin, can you move to the next slide? And this is a very, uh, uh, I would say my favorite plot uh, so far because it covers all the LLMs that you are thinking of in the world that are being populated and, and has been widely spread. I tried them over this model integrity corpus on just asking the same questions 80 times in a different 80, 80 different ways and turning it to thousands of runs. It model runs one time, I ran it for thousand times. And I say that, okay, in thousand times, how do you answer? 
right? And I'm pretty much sure everyone would say that, oh, if you ask an individual a uh, thousand times the same question, he will just beat you, right? But let's say I just try it out over the LLMs, right? But what you what we see that, okay, the LLM are definitely, they, they are really, really pissed off. They said that, no, I'm not giving you any response any further than 60%, right? So all the response aggregated together was less than 60%. And that was one of the interesting use case for me that if I am using an LLM right now and Sanju is using it in India and Huawei is using it in an elsewhere place, right? Are they giving the same response to the same question? Or, and it does my dialect of asking the question might be very different than what Sanju is asking, right? And it will be very different from what Huawei is asking. And would this affect the way my outcome should be? I, I certainly think not because no matter whatever you are, if you are asking a question about what symbolic AI is, and if you ask the same question to Sanju, she will give the same response as what I will give. There will be a huge overlap between the two. But here, there's a there's no overlap between these LLMs, right? And the scores are pretty much negative in, in terms of the sentiments. And if you look at some of the similarities in terms of the keyword matchings, like keyword matching is very tough over here. So you see the keyword matching is not even crossing 40%. So this becomes a very critical use that, okay, with statistical knowledge, you can go this way. But with symbolic knowledge, you can actually achieve a consistency across various user bases. That is one of the challenging problems. We'll talk about more in the in a future slide, but that's just a glimpse of it. Uh, Hawken, can you move to the next slide? So this uh, black boxness has various issues, right? And when you talk about statistical AI in general, they are huge data and computation. You would always see your students. Uh, I am in an assistant professor, so I, I do interact with students. You have, uh, you might have people in your own uh, small businesses who might be talking about like we are running out of space. We need more computing power. So because you, the more you need for the GPTs, the more is more huge data, which is not easy to find, and huge computation, which charges a lot of money, right? So and the, some some uh, I, and then the issue comes about like even if I have it, what about the long tail situations? The situations which don't occur uh, don't occur very frequently in my data set, right? The situations which are very frequent, are very rare in my data set, but they do occur, right? And they can actually take my system down. What about those situations, right? Does the model acts like a symbolic structure? Like let's say I turn, I put in tons of data sets into GPT, can it form a symbolic structure for me, a symbolic knowledge that mimics an expert, right? How how am I handling the underlying biases? That is uh, that is uh, uh, perpetuating the the, mo the model structures, right? When does when the model needs to personalize? When the model should not personalize? When the model should abstract to a high level? When it should go into the details? All of these things comes very much natural to the human being, but that's exactly very hard to achieve in the context of statistical AI, right? Hogan, can you move to the next slide? So this is just one example of this scenario in picture where I asked uh, an example of about uh, of an individual who is talking about uh, his relationships, issues in his relationships and obsessive uh, interested thoughts. And I make a prediction, very nice, very simple, classic supervised learning phenomena. And what I got an answer was really triggered, was really worthwhile pointing it out in all the examples that I have given in the context of statistical AI. The answer it gives me is an obsessive compulsive disorder because obsessive compulsive disorder is exactly what is present in the post, right? And when I say that why the model predict why the model predicted depression, that's my question because I know the right the true value which is depression, right? Then sorry the 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 predicted answer comes out to be depression where the true answer is obsessive compulsive disorder, and what I want the model is that why the model predicted depression, that answer is unknown to me because the information presented to this uh, uh, this uh, model was not sufficient enough to make a distinction between these two anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. Also, sorry, to this, uh, two mental health disorders. So what we see over here is the two things. First of all, there's the second level of issue of reasoning that is very profound. The, sec the first issue is about the probabilities, right? You're only 70%, 71% true about your prediction. 29% is different. That is a not a sufficient use case, not sufficient confidence about why you think that obsessive compulsive disorder is a right label, right? So that becomes a one more challenging for the black box uh, statistical AI. Hawkin, can you move to the next slide? 
so these limitations can be uh, very much high in in magnitude starting with the incomplete knowledge in terms of the black box uh, ai and and in terms of the symbolic ai uh, aspect as well you have knowledge but how do you model them right and the symbolic ai also has a more limitation in terms of the scalability right so that's where you you cannot leave statistical ai completely you need the statistical ai because that is where statistical ai gives you scalability right but the statistical ai do not have knowledge right handling uncertainty handling uncertainty is very much prominent in terms of ai because ai has a huge literature on how, on how to handle uncertainty behavior but it needs knowledge to handle that uncertainty right the last point is the limited learning ability symbolic ai cannot learn that's why you need statistical ai so i would say that both of them has their uh, pros and the cons and they are actually trying to uh, compensate those limitations right and that's why we really want to focus on the neurosymbolic design of of ai systems can you go to the next slide right so this is just the uh, two thoughts the two worlds uh, uh, uh talking to each other one is a symbolic ai which does not require a huge amount of data but have a nice way of understanding your data right and whereas a machine learning which requires tons of data but does not know how to represent that data very well so there's a representation problem in the machine learning right it can represent it can give you numerical values perfectly fine no issue with that but does that in the uh, representation knowledge associate with the symbolic ai or the symbolic knowledge that's the question that's what i'm asking right so the reasoning is a is a challenge for machine learning right now i can i can be very loud and clear on this that if you can ask chat gpt can you give me a probability estimates or probability cons confidence estimates on your generation it cannot give you because those values those probabilities are so small so tiny small right that the model itself doesn't have a confidence that's why it always says you oh my apologies for the confusion this is what the answer is going to be so those things arise naturally to this model because of those probability estimates right so that's where machine learning has a big limitations reasoning and confidence on the input symbolic ai can allow you reasoning has a confidence in its in net systems next slide hogan so this is a very high level ar interact uh, architecture and it's uh, i'm open to any questions on this as well this is uh, an hypothetical architecture that we have been practicing in our in our work and it seems to be working relatively well uh, compared to the statistical ai so what we are doing over here is we are having a four blocks that are talking to each other the first block is essentially about the uh, what do you call the data which is essentially the data sources the second is about talking about the feature abstraction layers where i'm just talking about what the model can learn nicely from the data set the second is can i have a knowledge graph what part of the knowledge from this entire knowledge graph i really need to worry about so that's where i use the feature abstraction layer to extract a subgraph from this knowledge graph so though the c box that you see is a small subgraph being extracted using the knowledge graph now the next part is that do we have a workflow in picture right do we have a tree or a reasoning or a symbolic knowledge in structure that's the e part over there right and the last part is that more converting your softmax or your prediction into a tree structure so see that reasoning layer that i have fixed at the top where what you are saying is that you are not doing simply yes and no but now you're letting the model explode in all the possibilities and then you contract to see which of them is actually more stronger than the other right so you're letting the model uh, we'll talk about how do we implement these things in the later slides uh, in the in the future webinars but for now you can assume that these are the four blocks that you really need to work on when you want to integrate symbolic knowledge into the deep neural networks next slide so the, this is uh, I, essentially one another example of why i really 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 want this kind of uh, uh, architecture if you see over here i'm just uh, playing so this is one of my student who just played in 2020 uh, in last year on the llms and we recently released a, a, a metric that is at the intersection of knowledge graph and and neural networks right we have metrics on on the on the neural networks they are already there but we released a neural network or uh, we'll release a metric which is at the intersection of knowledge graphs and and neural networks which we call it the sage and what the reason was that 
the model is inconsistent. That's the problem that I was talking about just a few slides back, where I'm just asking the same question in multiple ways, and I'm getting multiple answers from that system. That's making it unreliable. So if you see over here, is violence a necessary part of life? Is violence a necessary part of life? And then is violence a necessary part of life? The same questions, but you get different, different answers for different, different times, right? That's the biggest challenge uh, of, uh, of, this, uh, of this kind. Uh, move to the next slide, Hoken. So this is one of the design where we, we want to design. This is how we design the metric. I just want to give a quick overview. Details I will talk about a little later. But if you see at the bottom, right, the, the box, uh, the first example is about a bro code and a girl code. Very simple example. But what I really want to know is that based on the tons of the data that the model is trained on, what is a rule that the model has learned, right? That ROT that you see is called the rules of thumbs. I'm not giving symbolic knowledge over here. I'm just telling that model. I'm just telling the model, learn over this entire encyclopedia of data, right? And give me the rules that you have learned. So these are the rules that the model has learned. Now, based on these rules, right, the model, I'm asking the model to make the decision two ways. Take this ROTs and give me the decisions. Take those, uh, those data points, make the decisions. These decisions should ideally match with each other, right? But that's not the case, right? These do not answer each other. They do not interact with each other. So something that the model has learned is inconsistent with the data itself, right? So how do we understand this? So this is a very simple example of how symbolic knowledge is really, really important because here we are talking about rules that the model has learned, rules that are very much present in the symbolic knowledge. Now, the question that we found was these rules associate very much with the symbolic knowledge, but they do not go aligned with the data. So that's again a challenging. I'm, I'm, I'm open to a lot of challenges at the moment, but this is one of the uh, issues that we found uh, in, in the current context of uh, various uh, uh, large language models, which are completely statistically driven. Uh, next slide, Hoken. So uh, the neurosymbolic AI structure, what we are really uh, interested in is to bridge the gap between symbolic reasoning and statistical learning, right? We really want the model to focus on both segment of knowledge, the top down, which is the symbolic and uh, knowledge graphs, knowledge bases, lexicons, rules, specifications, everything of the sort and the neural networks. And how does this fit to the curve? I just showed you in the previous two couple of slides, and this is a very high level idea of the same process. Here we are talking about the symbolic reasoning, which is talking about the deduction and abduction, non-monotonic. And let me just give you a very simple example to play around. Uh, just put a keyword next to your prompt in your large angle model that I want this answer by deductive reasoning. I want this answer by inductive reasoning. I want this answer by abductive reasoning. You will get different, different answers by straight away from this prompt itself. Right, because that you're then you're letting your model ch chance its mind on whatever reasoning it should follow, and you will see different different outcomes uh, on of this kind. Hogan, next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so there are fantastic works in terms of neurosymbolic AI. We really want you guys to actually look at as well, uh, which is uh, one fantastic book by Paula Paulo from on uh, neurosymbolic reasoning and learning. Uh, there is another book on your symbolic AI. Then there is another component of a book that I did not add it, but I really, really recommend you is with Lewis Lamb and Arthur, which is on your symbolic uh, uh, cognitive reasoning. Uh, that gives you a more symbolic flavor uh, uh, separate to the rising uh, statistical AI. But it will tell you what are the different forms of knowledge uh, resonates in those areas as well. And that brings me to the third book, which actually talks about the the cognitive reasoning part and the neurosymbolic structure, uh, structure, which is the knowledge infused learning, uh, which was a, a, a very interesting use case. We, we provided a lot of use cases in language modeling, computer vision, recommender systems, and, and many more uh, uh, AI, AI technologies. Move to the next slide, Hoken. So the key terms that we really want to focus on in terms of the neurosymbolic AI is the hybridization of the structure, right? We are talking about symbolic representation where you can simply uh, uh, synonymously understand it as knowledge graph embeddings uh, of, of this kind or embeddings of any uh, uh, external knowledge. 
uh, even if RAG, the retrieval augmented generation, we'll talk about that as well. Right? I'm just giving you names to uh, to turn your mind on. Uh, so the retrieval augmented generations and and whatnot are were really really exciting uh, ways of in, uh, of ingesting this symbolic representation seamlessly inside the AI AI framework. Uh, we talk about perceptions. We talk about we let the model uh, think on on multiple uh, 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 nodes uh, or multiple uh, branches, and not just having a softmax at the top. Reasoning is another aspect: is that the model understands or asks us these questions on whether the answer is more capable or more stronger enough. Right? Let's take an example. Right? Let's you have a five uh, uh, label predictions, and you put another teeny tiny label at the end. That just gives you the probability of how confident are you on these labels, right? That itself is a very powerful tool in understanding on the reasoning part. Is your model capable of reasoning or not by this teeny tiny labels? Let's say you have a five label classification problem. You put a sixth label at the end and you try to uh, tweak these labels saying that this label tells you how confident your model is on its predictions, right? And there is explanations and knowledge graphs and ontologies. These are all components of how you design your symbolic uh, representations. And explanation is certainly a very important factor because with different user base, the explanations changes, right? And so far we have been, uh, uh, I do not uh, uh, like uh, uh, completely refute that, but the Lime and Shab really were the first one to actually focus on the, on the explanations in terms of feature attributions, but they are a lot more than just feature attributions. There is always a symbolic knowledge that is required to steer the uh, explanations to the end user who are actually the decision maker of on your platform or on your model. The components of the neural symbolic AI is, as I said, the four or five components that I showed you in a high level, we can just boil down into neural networks. There's a symbolic representation engine, which is the knowledge graph embeddings, the neural symbolic integrations. A very simple example is a RAG. But then, then there is another uh, ways of doing that. You need to have an integration layer where these things will talk to each other, will optimize over each other. That's the integration layer. The knowledge base is essentially the component for symbolic representation uh, engine. Explanation generator is at the outermost layer, which is after you make the prediction, you want to generate an explanations. And the user interface is where the user gives you the feedback, right? Uh, in my understanding, what we will be we will eventually be covering are the uh, the all the uh, I think the six points in those components. The last point is certainly I'm that's not my my forte, but I'm happy to answer any questions on how the user interface is visualized in this neuro symbolic AI systems. Next slide. Okay. So this is the entire process of how if you once you have defined your structure of neuro symbolic AI, how do you initiate the training and how do you go from training to deployment in terms of in in uh, in, in such kind of systems okay. so uh, this is i i want to give uh, another piece of a uh, uh, illustrate Ill illustration at the implementation level right and we'll talk more in the future webinars as well this is what i call as a proactive inquiry from llms right now what is this about like, let's say i have a sentence or i have a query let's just let's just start very simple now that query can actually ex can actually get con context from various knowledge graphs so whatever the information that you gather from those about that query is extracted as a subgraph remember that uh, the big blocks that i showed you on, on the four factors this is a subgraph of that kind and that subgraph extracts the documents that are relevant for the context right so if your subgraph is wrong your document retrieval is wrong right now in the RAG sequence, RAG, which is the retrieval augmented generation, right? This is a flaw. This is where you cannot control that. You can control, you can get lot many documents which are not relevant, but with graph, you are able to make a more conscious hold over your document retrieval. Then your, uh, your model, I'm just giving a T5, you can have any LLM. You can train this LLM to give a response to this query. Now, this, qu this response may go off board from what it was supposed to give. And that's where rules or your symbolic structure comes to the picture. It gives you a reward separately of how to control your generations, right? So that's a reward interaction that's happening over here, right? And we saw that with this design, at least your model is 
able to be grounded in the domain and be instructable by the rules that that is given by the evaluator and the third part is the explainability which is coming just because of the llm's tendency of giving natural language sentences but we want to we want to stick that explanations to this graph to this documents only i would say more of the graph right and the next this another illustration is pretty much interesting as well that just came recently and thanks to hoken to bringing me to my uh, attention as well uh, this seems to be a more like a sandwiched behavior so in all of this cases we have talked about top down or uh, sorry uh, bottom up approach and the top down uh, together they actually realize that right so they the talks about you can actually have fine tune llms and you have fine tune llms in terms of what they want to be generating on and then you want to figure out that how does these two assume this right that you have an encoder and you have a decoder right neural networks and you want them to share their 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 knowledge right you want the encoder and the decoder to share their knowledge with each other that's what the middle strategy of the ping box looks like right i can go more details about it but i would like uh, I, in a way in a shell this is what the focus is so in essentially if we have a neuro symbolic structure and we are in the llm business at the moment this is what the cha uh, challenges that would be solvable through neuro symbolic ai first of all is a consistency second one is more about reliability with the different llms working in parallel or in different areas uh, user level explainability that's again a challenge and how do you make them to be less uh, 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 unsafe and more safe by through proactive inquiry if i don't know the answer i ask the user if i have the answer how confident i am in my answer and the last one is to address the trustworthiness that is actually dependent uh, as a dependent variable of consistency reliability explainability and and the proactive inquiry through safety i think uh, one thing we can do uh, in the comments of this webinar is we can share your paper on this uh, crest uh, framework yeah. and people can do further reading after the presentation sure yeah so uh, there are various use cases for neurosymbolic ai i have to add one more thing over here is called the crisis response or the crisis informatics and they have a huge usage a use uh, in in terms of healthcare as well right and uh, you can talk about robotics as another example which resonates very much with planning and scheduling right so there are various use cases that you can actually explore with a neurosymbolic ai the question here is that how do you build one system so in this short webinar we just gave you a high level understanding of how this neurosymbolic ai structure is designed uh, using llms right so first of all we can't uh, ignore llms altogether they are really a good learners in terms of the data but the question is how do you steer them steer them essentially to the rightful and rightful and consistent response right and definitely you will have higher accuracy uh, with these neuro symbolic structure i haven't i think i might have added over here a plot over this but you can look at my crest paper i have shown you that there are huge gains on in terms of neuro symbolic ai compared to statistically yeah next time we're going to be covering uh, an introduction to statistical artificial intelligence um if you've joined us this far and you're still here i just like to let you know we're accepting uh, membership applications for the storm community there is uh, many more events that are going to be coming into the fold next week we have another uh series running in parallel to the neurosymbolic ai series uh covering enterprise taxonomy and ontology and in addition to that uh in march 20th and march 27th we're going to be hosting some events around um a data-centric ai forum so we're going to be talking about the use of ontologies and fair data as a means for creating more flexible and interoperable and evolutionary systems that uh, can work work better, work more cohesively. Um, so thank you guys for, for sticking around. And thank you, Dr. Sanju Siwari and Manas Gaur for uh, putting all these uh, wonderful materials together. Is there anything you'd like to say to, to the audience? Um, Thank you. I would just simply say, if you have any questions, I do run over uh, things that are might be hand wavy in cases, but trust me, they are not hand wavy. They are very much uh, implementable. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, do uh, you can actually re reach out to Walkway, 
and my email id is my first name at the rate umbc which is my affiliation dot edu so if you have any questions i'm happy to answer that as well uh thank you for everyone for attending two more uh thank i guess you so much. Yes. two more promotions uh dr sanju has a uh, shot guru innovations and research labs and she provides uh corporate and private training in association with different universities um and dr manaz his background was previously in industry he went into academia and his uh, research currently produces tangible uh, outputs to industry and academia. So, you know, this is the real deal. Let, let us know if you need anything and we'll be in touch. So we, we are inviting intern students for graduate masters to associate with us and to doing the internship from various uh, uh, universities and research groups of Europe, America, and Asia, Africa, where are So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manas. Thank you, Akin. Thank you. Namaste to all.